After the events of Yamataya, once innocent Lara Croft is now a hunter, pillager, and a survivor. Despite attempts to tell the world what she saw, all evidence of Himiko and the lost city of Yamatai are erased, leaving Croft considered a fool, like her late father. With a shattered psyche and a tarnished family name, Lara takes up a new challenge in Rise of the Tomb Raider, redeeming her family's name and proving to the world, and perhaps to part of herself, that she isn't crazy. After the 2013 reboot of Tomb Raider, Croft seems to be heading in a new direction that, while separate from that of her older adventures, couldn't separate itself from the very series that it inspired. But really quick, I want to level with you all. The name Lara just doesn't roll off the Newfie dialect very well, so in my first video I thought, hey, I'll just say Laura and nobody will care. Tomato, tomata, Sasha, Sasha, Tara, Tara. I thought very wrong, and a hell of a lot of you pointed out how much it bothered you, so as promised, we'll be calling Lara by her proper name, but if any of you have read my name aloud and called me that boy Aqua instead of that boy Aqua, sleep with one eye open. With Croft's latest adventure performing well enough, it wasn't long before we received a new entry, this time being Rise of the Tomb Raider, which I hope is the game where Lara reaches her potential and truly embodies the modern Tomb Raider. Some were expecting this to be a return to older games, and while I can see why, I expect something new as this is still a reboot. The term reboot used in the last video explained why I wasn't wanting just another older game, and judging by the comments, that needs more clarification. I know that the definition of reboot is a restart or revival of a series, but in a gaming context, what I've come to expect from a reboot is something new. I know that the older games had greater fantastical elements, and Croft was more of an unrelenting badass than she was here. But if Lara was the same in these games, I'm sure many would question the need for a reboot at all. Why not just make a sequel? That's why the 2013 Tomb Raider wasn't received as well by diehard fans, and there's merit to this, with there being few actual tombs for you to raid. By the end of the game, after Lara transformed into the badass reminiscent of her previous incarnation, many, including myself, are ready to have a sequel that fulfilled an adventurous power fantasy from start to finish, with hopes of better puzzles, a better story, and a better Tomb Raider. And what did we get? Well, let's say we got a developer that, more or less, listened. We have gameplay that has made some significant improvements where needed, a presentation that is just as good as the previous, if not better, more means for replayability, and a story that, while significantly worse than the first game in my eyes, does more to develop Lara as a character even if it's taken in a direction many don't agree with. We interrupt this video to tell you that we have discovered that boy Aqua's password. What? No, you didn't. Oh yeah? How else would we know that you use the password 123456? I don't use that password. How? Statistically, over 100 million people use that password, and I'm sure you do too. I mean, I used to have pretty bad passwords, but then I started using today's sponsor, NordPass, which generates strong passwords and remembers them so I don't have to. Well, it says here that your password for Facebook was leaked. But, yeah, but NordPass notifies you of that, so I was able to change it immediately. Oh, well, alright then. Yeah, man, I don't want to be that guy, but can I just get back to what I was doing? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll just go. No, it's cool, you're chilling, man. But for real, NordPass is a solution to the amount of breaches and security risks out there. I've been using a password manager for years, and NordPass not only keeps track of all your passwords, alerts you of breaches, syncs to multiple devices, and keeps other personal data like credit cards or addresses safe and secure, but they even have an autofill feature, making logging in and keeping track of passwords as easy as ever. You can also check the health of your password, which is determined by its complexity, age, and if it's used for other accounts. Best of all, the passwords are only saved to your account. Even Nord themselves can't see it. It's even more affordable than ever too, especially when you use code ThatBoyAqua or click the link in the description to get an exclusive offer. So get control of your internet security, stop using the same password for every account, and I know one of you out there uses the word password for your password, and grab NordPass. In the previous video, I took a look at the reboot through an uncharted lens. And just to clarify, I won't be doing that here, but I want to revisit that idea a little bit. In the first video, I attributed a lot of things to Uncharted, but specifically, the movement should not have been seen as Uncharted inspired, as it's nearly identical to the older games. There's also a strong argument to be made that Uncharted was simply the next step in the Tomb Raider games being that they were so inspired by them. I mean, the game didn't have the fan title of Dude Raider for nothing, so a new Tomb Raider game would of course share some similarities to Uncharted. I still think some elements, like the execution of a supernatural force and reworked shooting are inspired by Drake and crew, but seemingly attributing everything to Uncharted was a major mistake on my part. So I won't be looking at this game with an Uncharted perspective, as I feel it's now best to look at it as a sequel and as its own thing. 
I also bring this up because this game does a lot to not only build on the reworked Croft scene in the first entry, but adds even more mechanics that reimagine features from the older games. Rise, as I'll be referring to it from now on, is a game that allowed me to feel the developer's passion. The wider selection of outfits, locales, and weapons tells me that fun was a large priority, and in terms of a sequel, the many quality of life changes are enough to keep the game fun throughout, and the reworked and improved mechanics make the gameplay loop fresh despite the foundation being largely the same. I know I sound like a broken record, but improving upon and expanding the concepts and ideas of a game are what makes a good sequel to me, and I feel this game does that pretty well. That doesn't mean there are not some things I don't agree with, but ultimately this is a lot better than Lara's previous entry. Our first foray into the Survivor trilogy was one that did less to set up who Lara is and more who she will become. Most of what we learn during the main story is of her connections, and we can infer a few things from those connections and of course from the audio logs around the map, but that was not where the story wanted us to look. What they put front and center was an innocent Lara, green as grass, strong in her convictions, but sheltered in a lot of ways. That game's story is her transformation into the obsessive huntress capable of surviving any obstacle and plowing through however many hundreds of men are in her way. But that's not her entire story, and with her transformation complete, the developers can either choose to somehow reset her or explore another chapter in her Book of Secrets. One of the first trailers for this game was of Lara in a therapist's office, attempting to deal with what she saw in the first game. But let's leave that part of her psyche behind and look at what the developers did physically to Lara. Physically, the game establishes off the bat that, rather than add new tools for Lara to use and meaningfully expand her arsenal, they'll just simply take away all your toys in the first few moments, allowing you to go on a quest to again acquire the tools to help you along the way. Early on after a close call, it seems that Lara is left with nothing and barely any excuses given to this. I understand that I can't expect Lara to bring a shotgun with her and I'm not asking for that, but things like a lighter, which was invaluable in the first entry as there were fire arrows or a knife, which has many uses in this very game, could easily fit into her many pockets. The developers made it clear that progressing Lara was important. She still suffers from the trauma of the first game and even has physical scars from the first game. Remember when she is taken prisoner in the first game and is smacked with a pistol? That scar is still here, and this is intentional. And by the way, I love that kind of shit. But the horrors carry over physically, so why don't her abilities? It's further confusing because she has plenty of new tricks this time around. This might seem like a nitpick, but something as minuscule as Lara not packing a lighter in cold weather where fires are going to be very useful means that fire arrows, something we saw plenty of in the first game, are not reintroduced until later on. In fact, almost every upgrade here is just reacquiring something, or getting something that merely serves the same function as another upgrade, making you think that it's new, but it isn't. Let's begin by looking at the different arrows available for you here. The first is the poison arrow, which is, if I'm right, entirely new. It creates a cloud around wherever it is shot, and it is invaluable for taking down beefier foes like bears that can move quickly. This is one of the first upgrades you get in the game, and it's a great start. Then you unlock the fire arrows, which are identical to their appearance in the first game. But the final arrow you get is the bomb arrow. These can be used to destroy barriers, and this is an entirely new upgrade. But it serves the exact same purpose as the grenade launcher from the first game. And guess what else? You can buy the grenade launcher early and before you get the bomb arrow. Meaning you can completely render this upgrade useless before you get it. Another upgrade you can buy is the Rope Ascender. It wasn't a major upgrade in the first game, but it just made getting around a little less inconvenient. But I wonder why it wasn't just given to you here. I'll admit, it isn't needed here, as the backtracking you do doesn't see you crawling along a rope. But why is this not an immediate upgrade at all? It just escapes me. Now just because Lara's tools are masquerading as something new doesn't mean she isn't sporting some new abilities. The largest of which is that her light jog can be toggled to a full sprint. And this lady hauls ass. Which made the collectible nabbing an intense set pieces even more suspenseful and enjoyable. Something the older games had was a grappling hook of sorts and we find a reimagined version of it here with the wire spool, allowing us to reach greater heights and swing farther gaps. Something else Lara has picked up on is the ability to not only mine, but to craft as well. There are a myriad of scraps around the environment to be used in crafting ammo, equipment, upgrades, weapon upgrades, and on-the-fly tools. Spot a bottle of liquor? Quickly turn that into a Molotov cocktail. A tin can? That can be turned into a shrapnel grenade. This, while a small change, goes a long way for adding variety to encounters. Hell, some encounters were finished before they started, as I was able to grab flammable objects and light an entire squad on fire making quick work of them. 
This simple mechanic also ties into Lara's character as well. She's someone who survives by any means necessary. This doesn't mean scrounging around for pistol bullets, this means using bottles as weapons, cans as makeshift grenades, and in many ways using the environment to your advantage, and eventually, using your enemies. When you do unalive an enemy, you can booby trap their corpse to spray poisonous gas upon anyone who investigates, and their radios can be used to attract and injure enemies much the same. When I close out my thoughts on the first game, I mentioned that things like stealth needed more substance, and I cited one encounter in a forest as to why I felt there was untapped potential. And here, there are stealth scenarios in the forest that feel amazing with all of these tools. I'll admit, there are still some issues here, but from a sequel perspective, this is a major improvement and feels like the developers really wanted to improve the game. I even wanted the first game to have a sprint button, but declined mentioning it because I thought it was nitpicky. Of course, the developers were likely pressured to do better as Square Enix stated that Tomb Raider under performed. Perhaps this is why the developers seem to go for a if it ain't broke don't fix it strategy in some areas. The combat is largely unchanged from prior entries. Through the addition of ride shields and a new supernatural force, I'll admit there's a greater variety here, but mechanically everything works the same and that's not a bad thing. I have just one minor gripe about the assault rifles however. I criticized the bullet spread in the first game, but, and I can't figure out why, the assault rifles are even more inaccurate. Their reticle is huge, and they are inaccurate enough that if you're aiming for a headshot, which only requires one bullet on most enemies, why not just use the pistol? And if you need to be up close to use the rifle for body shots, then use the shotgun. The bow is also overall the best weapon for being silent, accurate, and satisfying. And so I just felt like the use for the assault rifle was really limited. Their climbing axes also have greater versatility here in combat, with the takedowns performed by all weapons being great. There are a few less noticeable changes this time around, like the cleaner UI and animations, like Lara slowing down in heavy snow, but there are some more notable ones like the addition of side quests and more open areas. The most noticeable improvement here is the visuals that look surprisingly better than the first game, which already looked gorgeous, and Lara's hair continues to be unrealistically lush even in the harshest environments. I'm not complaining though, look at it. Her face has seen a few tweaks too, which make her seem far more human and pushes her out of the uncanny valley in my eyes. Hell, she even has neck animations when gasping for air, and it's such a slight detail, but it truly goes a mile for realism. The same is true in gameplay when Lara's clothes crease and crinkle with different movements. The game also made me realize that Lara is a bit of a lowrider, with her being 5'11 and most other characters being a flat 6 feet. While the game looks significantly better and has more improvements to flex its technical prowess, I can't say the same about the performance. There were no major hitches here, but the frame rates were unstable at times and the motion blur just didn't work at all. It's just like the first game where I kind of have to nitpick to find anything wrong here, or not that I have to, but highlighting the things that are wrong presentation-wise says the same as if I listed the tens of things that the visuals do right. The point is, if the biggest thing I can complain about is the motion blur, which most people turn off anyways, it says a lot about a game's quality. The first Tomb Raider had just one setting, and while it was a good one, it meant that the color palette was mere shades of dark green and brown. Here we get palettes of white, blue, green, brown, and while it isn't as varied as other games, the changeups here are great. The geothermal valley has a far lusher scenery with its waterfalls and flourishing wilderness that is far gone from the Soviet installations that bear harsh snow and even harsher enemies. Even Lara herself gets a few new outfits this time around as opposed to her first outing. She actually has a jacket, appropriate for the weather, and when she doesn't have a jacket, she actually got one from somebody! There's an even wider selection of optional outfits this time around too, along with some more nostalgic ones, meaning there's something here for everyone, and my personal favorite being the battle-worn outfit. I know this might seem too minute to bother praising, but it offers variety in the character model, which is on screen all the time, and it feels more realistic. Something the first game did to instill this realism, left over from its origins as a survival horror game, was the rather gruesome death scenes. In the first game, some criticized the death animations as manipulative, or fetishized? And I don't fully understand that criticism, and I personally felt that they added more weight to the feats Lara is pulling off. In most games, if you died, you just fell over like a big teddy bear, but Lara was actually killed. Even if it was cartoonishly gory, it made it feel more tense. If you didn't like it, then congratulations, they are mostly absent here, which is a little disappointing, but it's not a large issue. The deaths that are here, such as when Lara falls into a trap, still have their shock value, but they are shorter, perhaps to reflect the near instant nature of these fatalities. Let's talk about the new supernatural force in the game, and actually, calling it new is a little too forgiving, because trust me, You've seen this before. It's the exact same as the Oni from the first entry. Tell me if this sounds familiar. These enemies are handled quite well in the early game as they aren't fought. Rather, they are avoided and it makes them really feel like an enemy you can't take down. Until you do. With considerable ease. 
Then, once you take one down, you start going through a small army of them on your own. Now, fortunately, I can save a lot of time here by saying that my praise and criticisms are the exact same, but the new criticism is that it is the exact same. It doesn't matter if something as significant to the story as this is still good. It's not new, which makes it feel a bit lazy. And furthermore, in this case, it's not all good, because as I said, mowing through these soldiers by the hundreds completely shatters any sense of tension with the enemy. In our last outing, the supernatural enemies were actually the final boss, and I'm somewhat happy to report they aren't used for that here. Rather, we have a boss fight against a helicopter mixed in with waves of enemies. For a climactic battle, it feels just barely good enough. It wasn't necessarily challenging and there's little nuance to the fight, but as a spectacle, it worked well. What follows is perhaps the shortest one-on-one -on -one fight in the game, and one of the shortest boss fights I've ever completed. It sees Constantine stripping Lara of her weapons and she's now back to square one, attempting to take down someone with a gun in close proximity. What does it take to even the odds here? Maybe it's a test of your skills up to this point. Maybe it sees you using different takedowns and tactics, with each tactic being accounted for once you use it, like with Mr. Freeze. And no, you just use a few cans to craft a smoke grenade, allowing you to sneak in not once, but just twice. It was over in less than a minute and felt extremely tacked on. I can understand the interpretation that this isn't the final fight. The helicopter was, and this is just a vanity fight to give Constantine a proper death. But I still felt as though it did more to underwhelm than it did to satisfy. Perhaps something like this would have worked better if Constantine was better established as not only someone who deserved to die, but who we as a player wanted to kill. One final thing on the improvements this game made as a whole. Remember those subtitles from the first game? The ones that were so bad I had to turn them off? Well, this time around, they look good and even have a high contrast version if you happen to miss the old ones. Some of you brought up that the subtitles from the first one are great for people who are visually impaired, and from an accessibility standpoint, I totally agree, but finding a balance between style and accessibility is important, and having an option here is a great way to strike that balance. So it's clear that Lara's tools and abilities have not changed much in this sequel. Her movement is largely unchanged, as is her combat abilities. The addition of crafting and more in-depth stealth options are great too, but where the real change comes in is how Lara uses her abilities. The largest criticism I saw, and even myself levied against the 2013 Tomb Raider, was that it barely had any tombs. I still believe it had the exploration elements and even some basic puzzles to fill that void, but the actual tombs that were there were bare, and often not even tombs. Just crash sites. Something the main story did well enough, and even these side tombs to an extent, was give you puzzles to work through. They weren't brain scratchers by any means, but I appreciated that they took some thought, even in the very quick side tombs. Here, the main story had fewer puzzles, and I didn't feel that they were as good as the first. I mentioned that the wind puzzles were a highlight in the first game, and yet they are nowhere to be seen here aside from one tomb. Of course, I appreciate not reusing ideas, but there was potential for more to be done, and it wasn't. The puzzles that are here are not bad, and the solutions make sense. But the problem is that the game takes this no-player-left-behind mindset where in almost every situation, you are funneled to the solution. Let's look at the ice ship, the first optional tomb you'll come across. It's a massive ship encased in ice. You arrive at the first platform and have no way of scaling the ship, and the only interactable is a gear. And once you interact with it, it lowers a climbable object, which you then climb to get to yet another point where you can only interact with a gear, and with very forgiving timing to get to another climbable object. This isn't a puzzle. There is no forethought or problem solving, there's no wrong move, no mistakes to be made, and nothing to learn from the environment. But this is one of the first puzzles in the game. I imagine the game just wanted to go easy on new players, and the large scale makes me believe that spectacle played a bigger role here than actual head scratching. Let's instead look at one of the last puzzles to see where the pinnacle of our wits are tested. The last secret tomb you'll come across is the Lost City. It sees a cage trapped underwater by a rope, and through freeing the cage and causing an explosion, you can enter the room containing your prize. This puzzle is actually great for a few reasons. Before you enter, you can see this cavern that is dispersing gas, and due to a flame it occasionally combusts, and this shows you how the gas works. But if you played the first game, you'll already know how it works. The puzzle before it starts shows you the exact gimmick present and how to use it in less than 10 seconds, and I think that's great. The actual puzzle itself has plenty of moving parts and different wrong moves you can make. This made the eventual realization more satisfying, and even then, this isn't super complex. You just cut the rope, move the cage into position, flood the room with gas, and fire away. The problem with this is that this is the full extent of the puzzle's complexity in the entire game. Most are fun, but forgettable, and I wonder if maybe I'm asking for too much. 
Either way, the optional tombs and puzzles as a whole can feel more like a tour of a tomb, where your hands are kept inside the cart the whole time rather than raiding a long forgotten location. One thing I absolutely loved with the puzzles here is that when a major step is achieved, the game saves it. It made puzzles like the solar system far more enjoyable. My platforming abilities aren't the best, so spinning a platform to the right spot, missing the jump, and then dying would become frustrating if I had to put it in the right place again. But this isn't an issue here. So not only does it save time, but it didn't discourage me from experimenting as to where I jumped, because if I fell, it wasn't a major setback. Well done. I enjoyed the puzzles in the first game a bit more, but this game had a greater variety and a greater consistency, so it was up in the air which is better. I still think that the puzzles here are a step in the right direction regardless, and exploring a cave or passageway just to find a secret tomb was always intriguing. Within some of these tombs and crypts you come across booby traps which acted more as roadblocks or inconveniences than anything. They added to the atmosphere and it is admittedly badass when Croft shoots two spike traps headed straight for her jugular, but I would have liked to have seen more variety and a better means of avoiding these traps, as they are easily defeated by Lara's NBA level jumps. I want this particular idea to be taken with a lot of salt though, because I can't think of a better way to handle these traps for now. Fortunately, online, the traps don't slow down, so you actually have to pay attention to the environment to spot them. I'm not sure if this would work in single player, but if Lara called out, hey, I need to watch out for traps whenever somewhere nearby, that would work great. I'm gonna starve in here. Oh, I got trapped. Oh, I fuck! Stealth on top of seeing new abilities sees new ways to utilize them, and they go hand in hand with your movement abilities. Climbing trees is now more viable and you can climb much higher. You can also now shoot climbing arrows into tender wood for scaling, but the game relies on the same old tricks to add tension to climbing, resulting in, weirdly enough, the opposite. In the first game, I mentioned that so many things break away at your weight that it became predictable. If you are climbing something and see another path directly out of your way, you know something will break away causing you to take the different path. In this game, things break away or slightly crumble as you climb them, but it always breaks at your pace. If something breaks away, it does so only when you leave the object, which completely killed the tension. It turned the added tension into a fourth wall breaking wink that I'd make towards the game as I thought, aha, I see what you're trying to do here, and it isn't working. A simple solution would be to make the breakaways less frequent, otherwise the movement feels a lot better here and it's far more forgiving. The reason having tight movement is important is because you'll be perched in trees far more often in stealth. I'd argue that the best puzzles in these games is the enemy layouts, as while I think they're tough, they're a joy to replay because of how many different ways you can approach something. In the first game, your choices were melee takedowns and bow takedowns. That's still here for sure, but enemies are smarter, so sticking to the same tree won't work as they will actually look up. And the layouts make melee takedowns more situational. You now have options of hiding in bushes, water, and using objects to distract enemies. Better yet, the many traps you can set offer even more replayability, making stealth here a test of patience and strategy. While I think the AI here is good, it has a few flaws. The first is that enemies sometimes can spot you without actually seeing you. There were a few occasions where I would throw an object and every enemy in the room knew exactly where it came from, which was annoying. The worst of this is actually during what could have been the best set piece in the series. Along her journey, Lara obtains a rebreather and some warmer clothes, allowing her to hang out in the water indefinitely. Trinity decides to obtain some smoke grenades and thermal sights. This leads to an area where Lara has to swim underneath a thick sheet of ice and poke up through different holes to take down her enemies clouded in smoke. Not only is this a pinnacle of guerrilla warfare and a badass moment for Lara, but picking off these enemies one by one and seeing them panic at the boogie woman coming out of seemingly nowhere to kill them was so good. The problem is that they can spot you near instantly and they always know where you are. Even when I wasn't spotted, at least two enemies would gravitate to whatever hole I was near. And that works on one hand, because then you aren't waiting for long, which can be a problem here. I've praised stealth when it requires patience and planning, so obviously some waiting is fine. But the reason it is okay is because the waiting is optional. If you're skilled enough, you can quietly plow through a patrol, but here, your ability to strike is entirely dependent on an enemy being in the right spot. The problem that happens here is that there's always two enemies at a hole, meaning you're guaranteed to be spotted, which turns what was otherwise my favorite set piece into a game of taking an enemy out, waiting for a bit, and if I'm lucky enough to not be spotted immediately by the guards, rinsing and repeating. I could very well be missing something here, but on every playthrough this was a problem for me and I couldn't figure it out to save my life. I'm lucky enough that the idea here is so cool that I still look forward to it each time though. 
The rebreather you use here allows Lara to dive underwater for deeper exploration, but this was usually used as a means of hiding secrets, which I liked. The secrets here are unchanged from the first game, and that's perfectly fine because they worked there and they still work here. They again offer context to your journey, though I felt that this time around, integral plot points weren't entirely left to comics or audio logs, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't poke around and see what you can learn. I mentioned that the Icewater Stealth was one of my favorite set pieces and you might be wondering what the others are like. And much like the first game, they're fun in the moment, but don't stick around for very long after. Ones that did were when the Deathless Ones were firing flaming arrows at you as you scale the massive structure in the archives, another was when you're running away from the helicopter down the waterfall, and another was the defense of the Geothermal Valley, where we use our newfound shotgun to just mow through Trinity. I think my only complaint is that this set piece feels really small. It's a fair number of enemies, but it feels like the heart of the battle is somewhere else, and we're just holding down the sidelines. But I'll admit, seeing someone get launched across the room by a shotgun is really satisfying. When it comes to the set pieces here, I think the reason they aren't as memorable is because things move so quickly. The only downtime here is during the puzzles, really, and that's a stellar problem to have. Things don't move too quickly, but the game sure as hell doesn't let you get bored. It's why I didn't criticize the length of the first game, which isn't much shorter than this game. If it's of quality, then I don't mind something shorter. An argument can be made for both games that the story they're attempting to tell isn't the best, but from a gameplay standpoint, I was consistently entertained, and I could easily see myself returning to this game sooner than later. So while the first game had a solid main story, many felt it lacked side content. Now me? I don't mind the side content being on the short side if the main plot is fun, which it definitely was, but I'll admit that the aforementioned tombs needed more substance. Here, as mentioned, some of the tombs are straightforward and some are more engaging, but there's no denying that there is plenty of variety here. There are also genuine side quests here too. They aren't much, but I enjoyed the low stakes fun that they provided. Things like clearing out a wolf den, collecting trinkets, destroying objects, it's all quite simple, but the rewards are what really make these for me. They were often meaningful, and even when they didn't serve a purpose, they were stylish as hell. One of the first I completed rewarded me with a lockpick, which allowed me to open more chests and gave me more loot. Another gave me an attachment for my weapons, with some like suppressors for rifles being a major tool for stealth. One mission saw me repairing some towers in the geothermal valley, allowing me to access the diving point at the top, the high dives being one of the many challenges in the area. Challenges are as straightforward as it gets. High dives, destroying statues, lighting braziers, burning flags, the usual. They forced me to pay more attention to the environments, and this goes for things like the survivor caches in the new collectible, murals. Lara now has access to a few new languages, but she's reasonably rusty. So to brush up on her different lexicons, she has to use context clues from murals, signs, and monoliths. This was an interesting idea, and in a lot of ways was executed well. The monoliths show the way to survivor caches, which give you a specific currency used to obtain upgrades. I mentioned that I didn't like how upgrades from the previous game that Lara should have on her are locked behind these walls, but moving past this, being able to unlock outfits, suppressors, weapons, tools, and more behind collectibles encourage me to explore. Find every mural, dig up every shining object, and find every audio log and letter. And it helps that the stuff you find here is interesting enough, especially when accompanied by Lara's commentary. I know this is pretty tedious in a vacuum, but when the main story is so action-packed, I found myself enjoying some low-key rummaging around a lot more. Even the hunting, which was pretty basic, has seen some additions here. Most notably in the wildlife, like the bears, which are beefy as all hell. These things can take literal explosive arrows to the face, and are always a challenge to outrun and outgun. The animals here have smarter AI that can recognize when you're in a spot they can't reach, and they'll retreat before you can cheese them. They aren't encountered often, but they were always a fun challenge and their pelts are beyond valuable. Much like the first game, everything you do here gives you experience, and almost all the upgrades make a difference to gameplay. Some were more useful than others, like Avid Learner, which gives you bonus experience for every collectible found, and some like Extra Health are there just for the sake of it. But I like the balance here, assuming we ignore the previous criticism of her abilities from the first game being just unlearned. My favorites were always the self-centered improvements as things like jumping, booby-trapping bodies, and faster takedowns made the gameplay all the more fun. If you want to replay some set pieces with a new twist, you can do exactly that in the Expedition mode. There's replay, which you can use to just flat out replay a level, elite replay, to play with all of your upgrades, scratching that new game plus itch, and score attack, where you're rewarded for moving through levels quickly and efficiently with a higher combo and multiplier to your score. For these modes, you can choose a difficulty and choose from a series of cards ranging from outfits with bonuses to different buffs and debuffs. Stealthing around will be extra challenging when you're constantly on fire, but if your aim is sloppy, big head mode will help you stay on target. Depending on the cards used, they'll either add or take away from your score with percentage multipliers. I think these cards, which were unlocked by playing the game, is a great way of offering variety when replaying levels, and I remember when this game came out, I did levels over and over again with different twists and challenges, so I can attest to this having a ton of replayability here. 
it's minor stuff adding all these modifiers, but it goes a long way. Furthermore, you can create custom missions that see you in different areas completing different tasks. These aren't too deep and they don't give you full control of everything, but being able to select a playlist of sorts of different objectives is something I could see myself returning to in the future, especially considering that you can play other people's playlists too. Of course, variety in gameplay doesn't stop at the 20 hour mark for those wanting to see everything, as the game has plenty of optional modes and DLC for you to dip into. There are some outfits you can purchase which are fun, but I'll only be speaking on the four major content packs here as I don't have much to say for the others. The first release just a few months after the main game and it's called Endurance Mode. This takes the survivor elements from the first, and especially this game, and applies them in arguably the best way we've seen. Lara jumps into the Siberian wilderness where she has to worry about the usual suspects like Trinity and traps, but a new foe has appeared. Warmth and food. You'll go through a loop of gathering materials, food, and of course raiding tombs. Your goal is to find as many treasures as possible in Xville before you succumb to the weather. Or the tombs. Or Trinity. Or nature's wrath. But there's another twist. Time. Days go by as you rummage around for treasure, and with each day the wilderness becomes harsher and Trinity closer on your trail. Eventually only the toughest animals will remain, and the resources will become harder to find, making this a challenge fit for only the best and brightest survivors. I didn't get as much mileage out of this as you might, just because I've never been a fan of moving through levels, getting upgrades, and then losing everything because of a misstep, but that doesn't mean I can't appreciate it for offering the next level challenge though. And for diehard fans, this will be great, especially because you can experience it with a friend. I think this is by far the best way to experience this, as working with partners means you can make a few more mistakes, and it offers a more enjoyable gameplay dynamic. The map is procedurally generated, meaning that there will be plenty of variety, though I did find I was unlucky enough to loot a tomb that was a one-to-one -one copy of the one I looted prior. But either way, myself and Nam's Compendium had a fantastic time playing this. Oh what the fuck's my wrong? god, I'm so sorry, I didn't think it would explode right there. Why would you do that? I'm a lot warmer now though. The next DLC is Baba Yaga and the Temple of the Witch. It sees Lara taking down the Trinity goons in the Soviet mining facility and finding a woman named Nadia who tells Lara that her grandmother was taken by Baba Yaga, and that her grandfather ran into the Wicked Veil to find her but hasn't returned. We'll talk more about the story here later, but for now the gameplay here is some of the most creative in the game. The drug trip we go on is pretty spooky and I love some of the imagery here. When we move through the caves you'll see a bunch of skeletons and this alone is some creepy imagery, but it honestly made my skin crawl when they began staring and following you. I like that they just let this moment creep you out, and didn't bother with a cheap jump scare. After this you begin moving through the bushes and despite what the previous room would have you believe, Baba Yaga herself jumps out at you. Eventually we make it to a hole in the ground where we take care of some demon dogs and I found this set piece to be particularly reminiscent of the concept art for the first game in the Survivor trilogy. The developers have stated that the Survivor reboot was originally going to be a survival horror game, and during the first 20 minutes of Tomb Raider 2013, you can see that. And I get that same feeling here. After defeating the dogs, we see Baba Yaga's walking house closing in on us, and we dive into the water below to escape. It is unfortunately at this point, where the DLC loses all of its allure and mysteries, we find out that what we saw was a result of a hallucinogenic plant. I don't mind the game taking a realistic approach, and I actually don't mind their explanation for it here at all, but we get so little time here to be immersed in the mystery that it feels less like a haunting veil being lifted and more of the developers blueballing us. I feel like a DLC is the perfect time to get weird, you know? Go balls to the walls with ghosts and ghoulies and reveal everything right at the end. Fortunately, by the time we develop an antidote to the plants, we get a decent enough rope puzzle and a glorified gondola ride up to the witch's lair, where our antidote is knocked out of our hands, forcing us back into the nightmare. The fight against the witch is simple enough, but it got repetitive quite quickly. You have to take the witch's bucket that she's in and attach it to a post that pulls it in on top of a furnace. Once she's in position, open up the furnace and do that five more times. Eventually, the witch becomes wise and starts cutting at the rope, but a few shots gets her to hide away for a few seconds so you can focus on the surrounding enemies. I think having to attack the witch six times the exact same way is pretty boring as far as boss fights go, and I would have either liked a shorter boss fight only taking three hits, or one that has more variety to justify the six hits that it takes. Otherwise, the spectacle alone carries this fight, though by the end I will admit it was beginning to lose its luster, which wasn't aided by the way the game demystifies everything so quickly. This DLC, much like the main game, was on the shorter side with 100% completion taking no more than two hours, but I enjoyed it throughout. Its set pieces were interesting and a fun departure from the main story, handling the supernatural force in a different way than the main plot, though whether it was better I guess is up for debate. From a gameplay perspective, this DLC had it all from fun set pieces to a decent puzzle, and while this boss fight left some to be desired, it was still a semi-climactic finale. The next DLC is The Cold Darkness Awakened. 
It sees you entering a Soviet facility to disable three different machines, producing a deadly chemical heading for the remnants. There are infected roaming around, and they function a lot like zombies. They can't see as well, but their hearing is elevated, as are their cannibalistic urges. They are easily avoided and taken down in stealth, but if a loud noise is made, they can easily swarm and overwhelm you. When inside the facilities, Nadia from the Baba Yaga DLC will be walking you through the steps to shutting the place down. It sees Nadia asking you a question about the state of the facility, and depending on if the answer to her question is yes or no, you follow certain instructions. The puzzles were never too hard, if you want to call them that, and took as much thought as counting how many fuses are in a box and then flipping the associated switch. If you get the puzzle wrong, enemies will flood the facility to take you out and will continue roaming around making the next step more difficult as you now have to juggle stealth with puzzle solving. Once you disable the three plants, the main plant is overloaded, and to prevent an explosion you have to destroy some pumps in the main facility, but the noise means a near constant barrage of infected are headed your way. This was a challenging finale to the expedition that ends with a narrow escape and a stellar explosion. This, much like the endurance mode, has some good replay value, but the puzzles in the three facilities which stack on each completed facility, meaning one in the first room, two in the second, and three in the third, makes the puzzles the most mind-numbing part. The new environments and enemies offer an interesting twist that make it worth your time, but if you're strictly looking for gameplay, I wouldn't recommend Blood Ties. Blood Ties sees Lara fighting for possession of her estate, and in order to secure her home she has to explore it and uncover the secrets hidden within. You have to explore and find clues that not only show you where to go and how to unlock secrets, but you can also find tools that allow you to access new areas. Things like the crowbar can be used to open jammed doors and cabinets, and the master key unlocks a whole new wing in the mansion. I love the way the game funnels you through different parts of the mansion so that you can pick up collectibles that craft the Croft narrative. It's a story that on paper sounds boring. I mean, you're diving headfirst into the mundane just reading letters and inspecting trinkets, but the story and atmosphere truly elevates this otherwise boring concept to greater heights in gameplay. I said there wasn't much gameplay here, and I'm sure plenty of you are thinking of the other side of this DLC, Lara's Nightmare, which sees you ditching the story for the shotgun and fighting off demonic apparitions. The gameplay shares some DNA with its collectible-based counterpart as you still have to move throughout the mansion collecting guns and tools to make your journey easier. You start in a random room and collect weapons and eventually the master key with the goal of destroying three floating skulls which will summon the boss, which is just a really big skull, with waves of enemies in between his short phases. Take down the big skull and that's it. It isn't a major fight, but the waves of enemies were challenging enough. We have the wolves from Baba Yaga, the ghoulies that function like any other enemy, and the grenaders that charge towards you and are a damn annoyance on a good day. I like that every time you start a run, all the weapons, tools, and skulls, and even your spawn point were changed. It offered good variety to these runs. I know I've harped on about variety a lot in these different expedition modes, but that's just because variety and replayability go hand in hand, and are important to me in terms of what I do and don't come back to. Overall, the DLC provided here is pretty solid. I think the gameplay in Baba Yaga is a high point for sure, and the story provided in both is equally good, but maybe my standards have been lowered by the story presented in the base game, which while not downright awful, wasn't something I cared for. The story begins with a deep dive into Lara's psyche post Yamatai, but then ignores plenty of other loose ends. I said that integral plot points aren't left to the comics, and that's true, but we are again left without context for events and characters that, if unaware of the comics, you won't understand or feel the true weight of. Since the events of Yamatai, Lara has been a wreck. Isolating herself more and more and still suffering flashbacks and nightmares, she still feels guilt from the first game, dreaming that she's back on the island and her friends keep dying. Despite what everyone else thinks, Lara feels that she led them there, and to their death. Furthermore, Lara and friends after Yamatai were tracked down by some remaining Solari, and kidnapped Sam, bringing her back to Yamatai, where she was once again rescued by Lara. Sam, over the course of the comics, still has part of Himiko's soul within her, and suffers episodes where Sam blacks out and Himiko wreaks havoc, leaving Sam to suffer the consequences of the law. Eventually, in prison, she is unable to contact Lara, and it seems the only place Lara finds comfort in is in her father's research, as it's the only thing validating her feelings and what she saw outside of Jonah. All of this is explained in different sessions with Lara's therapist, but it seems she's still avoiding the question of what she did to survive in Yamatai. The game officially opens with an audio recording of Lord Croft, Lara's father, and transitions to Lara and Jonah scoping out a mountainous climb in front of them. Where the rest of the crew has decided to stop, they keep going. The climb sees both risking their lives until a lightning strike separates the pair. We then cut to London where Croft is entering her father's apartment, but not before seeing a flashlight indicating that someone is poking around in there. She heads in to investigate herself but is interrupted by Anna. Her pseudo-stepmother who came into the picture a few years after Lara's mother was killed in a plane crash. 
Anna begs Lara to give up her obsession, but is supposedly unsuccessful. Lara then looks further into her father's documents, seeing that he was being followed by a secret society called Trinity, and that they might be after her too. Richard Croft was after a divine source that could supposedly grant immortality or even raise the dead, but was stopped by Trinity. After seeing what she did, Lara knows that the divine source must be real, and follows her father's trail to find it, leading her to Syria. Not before Lara gets a glimpse in a newspaper article detailing how her claims of what happened in Yamatai are met with the same skepticism that was levied against her father, calling her another crazy croft. While she intended to head there in secret, the driver she hired was paid off by Trinity, leading to her and the leader Constantine having a scuffle resulting in the raided tomb collapsing on top of the two. Lara barely escaping and empty-handed, but not before seeing a symbol that points her in the right direction. Lara then returns to the Croft Manor in the Blood Ties DLC, only to find a letter from her uncle Atlas, explaining that with her mother's disappearance and her father's death, he has the legal right to the Croft estate. This leads Lara on a scavenger hunt of sorts, moving through the house to find documents, and for us, it tells us more about what Lara was like as a child, and the circumstances surrounding her now. As a child, Lara struggled. She didn't have a mother for most of her childhood. Her mother, Amelia, was from a prestigious family that wanted nothing more than for her to continue her family's legacy with an arranged marriage. Amelia, after meeting Richard, abandoned everything and against her family's wishes, started her life with Richard, fascinated by his adventures and passion, eventually conceiving Lara. The two were an unstoppable pair. Until, while on her way to meet Richard, her plane crashed. And while she survived the crash long enough to write two letters, one to Richard and one to Lara, she still passed. Lara now had no mother and a father that, as a means of coping, dove further and further into his research, leading her to be neglected and act out far more, even trapping her butler Winston in the freezer, something longtime fans are surely familiar with. After finding the proper tools and keys, Lara is able to access the family crypt where she finds her mother's body, and learns that Richard dove further into his research in hopes of reviving Amelia, but to no success. Nobody knew where her body was so that Richard could experiment in secret, but now that her body has been discovered by Lara and the estate is legally in her name, she vows to return the manor and her family's name to its former glory. Lara then meets with Jonah in the manor, and despite his unreasonable pushback and someone attempting to assassinate Lara, the two decide they need to find the Divine Source. After this, Lara travels to Siberia, which is where the game opened. Lara, now separated from Jonah, tells him to turn back, and she goes back into survival mode, noting that it feels familiar. She witnesses the remnants, the indigenous population protecting the Divine Source, being hunted by Trinity, and eventually runs into them herself telling a woman named Sophia that she is not their enemy, though Sophia isn't convinced. Interlaced here are memories of Richard from when Lara was a child, begging him not to go on any more adventures, to no success. After being drawn in by an explosion, Lara sees that Trinity are torturing the remnants, and despite dying at their hands, they aren't giving up the location of the Divine Source. As Lara gains the remnants' trust, she spies on Constantine, reporting back to a mysterious person, but before she can gather more info, she's captured. When she wakes, she sees that Anna has been captured too, and Constantine begins choking her with hopes of getting Lara to talk. When that doesn't work, Anna reveals that for years she has been a spy for Trinity, and is the sister of Constantine, which leaves Lara rightfully angered. Constantine then wants to kill Lara, but Anna convinces him to instead imprison her in case she becomes useful later on. It's in these cells that she meets and escapes with a man named Jacob. As the two attempt to work through the Soviet installation and get back to Jacob's village, they are able to eavesdrop on Anna and Constantine, revealing that Anna is potentially becoming attached to Lara, and that she has a terminal illness. The two then continue towards the village, being split up and spotted by Trinity, and after a chase through the icy waters, Lara is knocked out but saved by Jacob, who is strangely unharmed. As the two continue to the geothermal valley, we learn that Trinity is planning an attack on their village. The remnants are not fond of Lara's appearance, but Jacob assures them that she is here to help, which she does as she defends the village. Constantine then hears word of this and is furious. It's in this scene that we see that he feels he has a divine destiny to be the one to obtain the divine source, as appointed by God. Lara helps the remnants more, saving them from Trinity, and finds out that the Divine Source can in fact grant immortality as it did to the Prophet, spoken about in many ancient documents. But the path to it is dangerous due to the supernatural Deathless Ones that guard it. If Trinity gets their hands on the Source, then they will be unstoppable. But before she can find the location of the Source, she must find an atlas that will show her the way. Lara grabs it and then heads to the observatory in the geothermal valley to inspect the map, but is interrupted by Trinity who kidnaps Jonah and takes the atlas. Lara comes to the rescue, but not before Jonah takes a fatal wound due to his inability to kill someone. Lara is able to bring him back to the observatory where Jacob, rather magically, heals his wounds. This reveals to Lara that he is the immortal prophet that the text describes. 
He explains that the source was used to grant him and his army immortality, but in attempts to protect the source, the Deathless army brought the ice down on the city, killing thousands. And in Trinity's hands, it'll be worse. Lara goes in to put a stop to it, fighting through waves of Deathless Ones and Trinity before destroying Constantine's helicopter and either leaving him to die or killing him herself. Lara eventually confronts Anna, who holds the Source, but is being quickly surrounded by the Deathless Ones. When Anna looks at the Source, it overpowers her and Lara then picks it up and smashes it, ceasing the Deathless Ones and ending the fight. Jacob, now without the Source and a fatal wound, dies. We then cut to the Croft Manor where Lara still feels guilt for destroying the Source, the undeniable proof that her family wasn't crazy, but Jonah reassures her that she did the right thing. It's there that the credits roll, but we get a post credit scene of Lara interrogating Anna. But before she can get much out of her, she's shot by a Trinity Sniper, who then aims in at Lara, but is called off. And that's where the story ends. I know that was a lot to go over, and unfortunately, that was still a fairly abridged version. The greatest issue I have with the plot here is that it feels as though there's so much going on and so many words are exchanged, and yet barely anything is said. Not only that, but we again have quite vital context delivered through audio logs and comics. You can still get the story through this game, but there are a few questions that you're left with, and pretty major ones too. How is Lara actually dealing with the trauma? Where is Sam? When did Anna come into the mix? The answer is she's seeing a therapist, but it isn't working. Sam was possessed by the spirit of Himiko that was left from her time in Yamatai, and hasn't been in contact with Lara, and Anna has been there for years. Let's look specifically at the twist with Anna, because it, much like with Whitman, has no impact or nuance because it just isn't established here. Anna, if you've just been playing the games, will make her first appearance at the apartment. We then don't see her until we are kidnapped, meaning the twist is revealed in less than 10 minutes of screen time and roughly two hours of gameplay. I don't believe that's enough time to establish a character and what she means to Lara. Anna continually explains that she loved Richard, but we don't see any of that. And it seems like Lara keeps her at arm's length as well. So when it's revealed that she's been working for Trinity the whole time, Lara is pissed, but as a player, we just met this lady and our first interaction was one of conflict. It creates a major disconnect, and this gets worse as we learn just how much of Lara's life was controlled by Trinity. Not only was Anna pushing Lara to lead them to the right place and keep tabs on the Croft family, even things like her therapist was working for Trinity, hence why they pushed her to stop her research. You can get an idea that the therapist isn't trying to help and has other intentions as he makes a few contradictions, like when he says spending time with those who also experienced her trauma will accelerate her healing, but then says Jonah is a poor influence on her, and that she should distance herself. But Jonah is the only person Lara is in deep contact with from the Endurance. They don't want her to heal, they want her to become even more obsessed, and cope the exact way her father did, but looking like a madman while leading Trinity to the right location. This idea of Trinity having their hands in everything Lara does is interesting, but it is spoiled near immediately with the reveal that Anna is working for them. I think an easy solution would be to keep the secret for longer. Reveal it closer to the end when Jonah is captured. Drop hints at it throughout the game. Set it up that Anna was captured by Trinity and it's revealed to Lara early on. When Lara meets Jacob, have her ask if he's seen a prisoner with blonde hair and black clothes, and he could respond saying he hasn't seen anyone like that. When Joan is captured, he could say the same thing, that he has no idea where Anna is. Then when it's revealed, it comes a bit more out of left field and with a bigger impact. I know it isn't that simple, as there are plenty of scenes with her and Constantine, but taking these out would be worth it because they serve an ultimately lame plot point anyways. There's a hint at a greater discussion in their final interaction with Lara, where Lara is explaining that death is part of life and Anna retorts with, it's easy for you to say, you aren't dying. And I think that's a great point, but there's nothing to expand on here. Again, through mostly audio logs, it's explained that Anna doesn't trust Trinity fully. She knows that she isn't important to them, but she is important to Constantine. That's why she cares so much for him, because her life depends on it. It turns out that she's been manipulating him and reinforcing the idea that he has been chosen by God all for her own personal gain. It's interesting, but it's so obscured that many people aren't going to see this or appreciate it. Constantine is this game's main antagonist, but truthfully, I couldn't care less for him. I think the reason I started to not like him was because I compared him to Matthias, an equally weak villain. Matthias at least had a decent motivation. He wanted to get off the island just like everyone else, even if that motivation wasn't as clear as it could have been. Constantine just believes it's his divine right. Yes, Anna is a motivator for sure, but aside from that, there is little motivation outside of Yahweh. He doesn't even care about Trinity, just about getting to the divine source and resurrecting God's army. I think I would have liked it more if both of these characters were combined in a way. Imagine you have a Constantine struggling with a terminal illness and being motivated by saving his own life. 
a similar idea to what Matthias's motivation was. He can try and justify it by saying that with this power, billions could be saved. The opposing side, Lara's side, would be that if it gets into the wrong hands, then forces like Trinity would have control over the whole world. And then it calls into question, who decides who does and doesn't get immortality? And what's stopping the select few from ruling the world or plunging it into an immortal war where neither side wins? Look at what the Deathless Ones did to stop others from getting the source already. Imagine the casualties if that happened on a global scale. With this, we could expand on the line Lara says about death being a part of life at the end, which the way it is now just feels like a hollow statement to me. Jacob could interject here as he is immortal. He could talk about the grim side of immortality. Watching everyone you love die out before you, not being able to become attached to someone because you know they will eventually leave you. He could argue that without an expiration date, our lives are meaningless. And when you have the time to have everything, you are ultimately left with nothing. Again, major story changes need to take place for something like this to work, but it's at least something. I just felt the story here played it so safe, and while it doesn't mean it's a bad story, it's worse. It's a boring story. I barely even have any nitpicks here aside from Jonah. Jonah's just sort of there for most of his appearances and that's fine, but I was so confused at the behavior we saw from him at the beginning of the game. Jonah was the only person that witnessed the horrors of the first game present here. Sam did too, and while she's present in the comics, she isn't here. He didn't see Himiko, but he still saw the supernatural weather and she has both Sam and Lara to confirm what happened at the mountain's peak. And yet he is skeptical of Lara's claims of the divine source. Why? I feel like if anyone's gonna be on her side, it's gonna be him! I know I've compared the plot here to the first game a lot, and you might notice that the plots here share the same problems. Underdeveloped side characters and antagonists, unfinished plot lines, and of course, necessary context being left to a comic series. So why do I enjoy the story of the first game more? Well, it's because of Lara's characterization. In the first game, she went through this transformation that I really liked. They obviously can't do that again here, which I appreciate a lot, because it would feel cheap and instead they put it on full display. Lara's experience is shown off here on a few occasions, like when she knows Nadia's gun isn't loaded. My name is Lara and your gun isn't loaded. I can see the cylinder is empty. And in another case when Jonah has a gun to Constantine, Lara without hesitation just shouts, do it. She's so disconnected from killing someone that she just immediately shouts for Jonah to shoot an unarmed man, even if in hindsight it was the right thing for him to do. Lara does have motivation for sure, wanting to save her family name and make her father's work worth something, but she doesn't go through much of a change. She has an arc of initially wanting to show the world the source, but eventually decides that she wants to destroy it instead. There isn't much of a change in her otherwise, and they don't necessarily need one. But we only get glimpses into Lara's psyche, leaving me wanting so much more. This is actually why I enjoyed the DLC so much. In the Baba Yaga DLC, we get to experience one of her nightmares and see that even after everything she's been through, her dad's death is one that haunts her still. I think a really interesting way to take the Baba Yaga nightmare would be to make us think we're back in Yamatai, just as Lara explains to her therapist, that she dreams she's back there, and we could see the likes of Reyes and Jonah dying over and over. Perhaps that's too dark, but if they're comfortable showing Richard summoning his persona outside the dark hour, then a grittier nightmare could work too. Showing what a character is afraid of is a great way to develop them further, especially in a game like this where Lara shows no fear in or out of gameplay. Narratively, I wanted more from Baba Yaga because the witch actually parallels Lara quite a bit. Seraphima was in the gulags and was once convinced by her captors that her husband had died, and in order to survive and as an act of revenge, she weaponized the plants and became a boogeyman, torturing her captors and anyone else who ventured into her territory. To me, that seems a lot like Lara having her friends kidnapped and in order to save them and herself, she had to become a monster capable of killing hundreds. There could have been a reflective moment for Lara when she looks at Seraphima, and from seeing how someone comes back from that place, possibly inspiring her to do the same. But I guess if Lara abandoned her life of adventuring and murdering, then there wouldn't be many more games. These sort of things hinge on her being a psychopath, and I get that. Fortunately, the Blood Ties DLC does more to dive into Lara's past, and it's a surprisingly interesting one. I enjoyed reading about how she acted as a kid, and it was satisfying to see that while she felt neglected as a child, she now understands that while she wishes she had more time with her parents, they died and sacrificed so much of their time for something important. I know that comparing the story here to the first is a little unfair because the first game didn't get add-ons that expanded upon the story told there, but most people are going to purchase the 20th anniversary edition of this game, which comes with all the DLC, so it makes sense to look at it as a complete product. Overall, Rise of the Tomb Raider, despite falling into the same pitfalls as the first game, and having some issues is a great time and a satisfying sequel. I think there are plenty of changes here that make it feel new and prevent the unchanged from feeling repetitive. This game also did more to reference and pay homage to the originals than the first did. 
I feel this strikes a good balance between doing something different, justifying the reboot, but being in touch with its roots, justifying the title of Tomb Raider. The presentation is as stellar as always, and while the combat is similar, the stealth has seen great changes and overhauls to make it suitable for the added replayability here. There are a wider array of environments and contexts to flex your skills, with modifiers adding even more ways to play. And while the multiplayer was ditched, I think swapping it for a co-op mode was a really good idea. The story this time around was in some ways weaker than before. But in other ways, it felt like a satisfying sequel. Even though Lara is nerfed in gameplay to add a fake progression, her characterization sees fewer setbacks. I just wish they expanded on more of the ideas here, and rather than having a web of unexplored plot threads, just focus on two or three and tied them up nicely. Speaking of untied threads, thank you again to Nornpass for sponsoring this video. And remember to use code ThatBoyAqua at the checkout, or click the link in the description for an exclusive offer. I mentioned in my first Tomb Raider video that I wondered if this game was titled Rise of the Tomb Raider because it was, in a literal sense, the rise of a transformed Lara Croft. And I think that's exactly what happened here. And I'm more than excited to try Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I've heard mixed opinions on it, some saying they liked it and others saying that it was the worst in the series by far, but we can get to that another time. For now, I want to close this out by saying I had a great time with this game. And despite its flaws, honestly, I think I like it just as much as the first three Uncharted games. And in some ways, I actually like it more. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this video. Um, I apologize, I really need to learn to shut the fuck up about Tomb Raider, but here we are, and I'm probably gonna do it again for Shadow of the Tomb Raider, especially if it's as bad as you guys say. God, I'm scared to play it, jeez. But that'll be for another video. Uh, as far as upcoming videos, I got nothing, man. I'm so all over the place right now, schedule-wise. I, I know I got a Freedom Cry video coming, and it's gonna be tiny, and then there's gonna be something else going on, but honestly, my schedule through midterms has just been shit. As you guys have probably noticed, there hasn't been an upload in a while, and I apologize for that. It's just poor time management and midterms, and I was helping a friend move the other week, and it's just, I just became very busy. But thankfully, uh, I have you lovely patrons who are supporting me through my little life Life turbulences that come around and I want to give a shout out to those patrons and YouTube members. A Beat, Ben Conway, Bossian, Chiefy, Edgar Sunday, Gonzo Gonzalez, J.MP3, Lee Mercuza, Mark Short, Pyrite, Ryan Hutcherson, and Sean Bailey. Then for the YouTube people, we have Logan Casey, Aiden Spark 77, Worshipper of the Olympians, Sad AMV, It's SRTW, Lane, and Boy Aqua Fanboy. Are you talking about like me? Like that Boy Aqua? Because that'd be kind of dope. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the video. I tried to be a little more... I tried to tone back the humor. I think I leaned too much into the whole letting my personality into videos. And I'm only saying that because watch time has been down lately. And that tells me that people just aren't enjoying the videos as much. So I tried to get a little back, a little bit more into my analytical zone on this one. Not to say that I'm, I've ever been very sophisticated with these, but you get what I mean. Uh, in the meantime, I have started a podcast with Nam's Compendium called Polar Opposites. We're having a great time recording it, and it's really just a fun side project for us to work on. You know, it, it's been a long time since I've made some sort of YouTube thing for fun, and it's really refreshing to be able to do that because, I mean, even though it, it doesn't take us very long to do it, it's fun to just have something to do just for the sake of doing something. And of course, it'll help me get better at voiceovers because I have to talk more. So I'm, that's how I'm going to justify it to myself. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want updates for anything. And yeah, if you want to support the channel, you want to support me and you want to get access to some decent benefits that I'm really bad at updating, you can support me on Patreon or support me on the YouTube members page. And that's about it. I hope you guys are staying safe. I hope you're staying healthy. I missed you guys. I love you all. Take care.